All right, uh, you can turn in your Bible this morning to Job chapter 38. Today we're going to talk about angels. What are they? And, and we're going to look at some of the uh, things that are taught about angels that are just simply a lie. <laughs> uh, but before we get started, I just want to say that um, this past week we went over 1,000 downloads there at Sermon Audio. And uh, that's an honor. And I give the glory to God for that, uh, not to me. It's not because I'm great or anything. And, and of course, I realize there are guys on there that get a, over a thousand per sermon, so, you know. But, you know, it's it's nice. And, of course, I, I'm thankful for all the people that have sent the nice emails. And, of course, the enemies, too, that send the nasty emails and call me a heretic and whatever else. I, I'm thankful for that, too. It's good for you. So, just wanted to make a quick note of that. Okay, Job chapter 38, verse 1. Uh, the first, last couple of chapters here, Job has been complaining, and why me, why me? So God answers him here. Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, Job. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now look at verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, that's where we're going to stop reading for now. But let me ask you the question. Who are the sons of God there? You say, oh, those are Christians that looked forward to the cross. <laughs> you know, that we, we look back to the cross now to be saved, and they looked forward to the cross. That's nonsense. Okay, that's Don't fall for that line. Uh, they weren't looking forward to the cross. There were no Christians in the Old Testament. Christians show up after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Acts 11.26 is the first time that they're called Christians. The sons of God here are very clearly there before the earth is created. Who are they? Angels. Angels. Yeah. They can't be anything else. Okay, turn to Job chapter 2. We're going to go back in time. Job chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Which is kind of an interesting thing, and we've been over this in other sermons, but the fact is, Satan has to present himself before the Lord. He's not just down, you know, he doesn't exist in hell, and that's his kingdom, and, and he's the enemy of God, and, you know, they're fighting each other. No. Satan is the en enemy of God, but he has to present himself before the Lord. But it says there again, the sons of God came and presented themselves before the Lord. Turn to Job chapter 1, verse 6, and we're going to see the same thing here again. Job 1, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Okay, now there are three references there in the book of Job to the sons of God, all three references are angels. Not one of those is a group of people. These are all angels presenting themselves before God. Okay. Now, there are five references to the sons of God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we are called the sons of God. Okay, If you're saved, you're a son of God. But in the Old Testament, there's only five references. So let's look at the other two. Genesis chapter 6. We're going to go back even further in time. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And of course, this is before the flood in the days of Noah. Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, 
the same became, became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Now, one of the ways that people try to interpret this is they say the sons of God there are the sons of Seth. That's a lie. Okay? Why? Well, because what I showed you at the beginning here, the sons of God are clearly angels. And why is it if these are just men, if these sons of God were just men, why does it make a specific point there that they were creating that their children were giants? Strange offspring. Okay, men, normal men and women don't have strange offspring today. They're not making any giants. And we're going to look at some of these giants, by the way, real quick. These are not people. Okay, these are, these are angels and women. And of course you have all these ancient, this ancient mythology with Hercules and all these other stories where these ancient people had these stories about gods coming in and having relations with women and creating these outstanding offspring. Now did they just make that up? Or were they repeating stories that were told down through the centuries? You know, and it could have even been going on then. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But the point is, these are angels, okay? Very clearly that these are angels. And that's going to be important later. That's why I'm making a point about that. Okay, and, and people say, but yeah, but uh, angels can't marry. Turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. We know that it can't be angels because angels, you know, they, they can't get married. Angel, or, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. This is another one that you'll hear quoted to try and disprove the angels of Genesis chapter 6 there. Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So you see, angels can't get married because they're, uh, they're sexless. Okay, they're, they're neither male nor female. They're just these sexless winged things up there that, you know, no, that's not true. Okay, these the sons of God in the Old Testament, the are the angels, and in, and it says here about them not marrying, but it says in heaven. It doesn't say about them coming down to the earth, and we're going to see here later about that they left their uh, first estate, they left their habitation to come down here. Okay, that's why they were fallen. Actually, we're going to see about that. Right now, turn to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. Don't go to chapter 2 or chapter 3, just Jude chapter 1. I like saying that kind of thing, just keep people on their toes, you know, whatever. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. You can't prove that it's, that it's not chapter 1, by the way. It's not heresy. Anyhow, Jude chapter 1 verse 6, or verse 6 if you want to say it that way. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, who are these angels? And another thing you'll hear is people say, well, they're demons. No, I don't believe that. I believe that they're, this is a separate class here. The angels that left their first estate, okay, they, they left their habitation, which was in heaven, where, they're, where they don't marry because there's nothing to marry in heaven, <laughs> okay? But they came down here to the earth and went in under the daughters of men and bare children. Now, they couldn't do that if they were sexless, <laughs> okay? You can't bear children unless you are a man, <laughs> okay? They're sons of God. They have the ability to bear children. But they also, it says here that they left their habitation. Yeah, they don't marry in heaven, but they can get married, quote unquote, down here. Right? They left their first habitation. Now, I want to look at something interesting here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to, I'm going to be tying all this stuff into to something here, which is really kind of strange. I'm going to be... Uh, playing a clip of a Hollywood movie, actually. Um, and the producers of it know exactly about this, all this information that I'm presenting here. But I'll show that in a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. 
Here you're given the thing of a man and a woman and uh, what the purpose of the two is there. Okay, verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Okay, now let me just stop there for a second. Feminism, as I have in another sermon, feminism is a sin. It's not that, you know, women are lower and they need to be put down. That isn't it. Women are created for a different purpose. And if you're a woman, you should want to be a woman and take the role of a woman. It's not, oh, you know, this it's a lesser role. It's kind of like a, a hammer versus a saw. You know, a hammer can't compete with a saw. You know, hey, are you going to cut a board in half with a hammer? No. Are you going to hammer a nail in with a saw? No. It's not that one is better than the other. It's that they're created for two different purposes. Okay? It's not, oh, the, the, you're putting down saws. You know, they're equal to hammers. No. It's two different purposes, two different tools. And that's the way it is for a man and a woman. They're not, God isn't putting the women down and making this male chauvinistic thing. No. God it gives women a very honorable place. I mean, two books of the Bible, Ruth and Esther, are named after women. I mean, think about that. You know, that's pretty incredible. And there are a lot of great women that are in the Bible. So the point is here, God created man first, but he said it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make an help meet for him. The man was not created for the woman. The woman was created for the man. And that's not a demeaning role. She's a help meet to him. Okay, so let's continue on here. Look at verse 10. For this cause, what's the cause there? The woman's created for the man to be a help meet. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. There's something about a woman that gets into feminism that says, I don't need a man. I will not have a man rule me. I won't have my father tell me what to do. I won't have a husband tell me what to do. I won't have any man tell me what to do. And at that point, she is open game for these angels. Now, if it's going on right now, this thing of angels coming in under the daughters of men, if it's going on, it's not really all that well known. And it could be, I don't know, uh, going on. But it's not really out in the open. But we're going to see, as the study progresses, that this thing is going to come back. Okay, it was going on in the, in the days of Noah. It's going to come back. Okay, now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm going to show you kind of a verse here. Uh, you know, it says that a, that a man or a woman is to be under the authority of a man there. That's the covering, by the way. It's not a... a physical covering, the power on her head is not some kind of a covering on her head. You know, we have a lot of different groups here. We have Amish Mennonite charity ministries, and they all have different coverings. You know, which one is the most powerful? <laughs> you know, well, I wear this little round thing on my head. Well, I wear the full, you know, blanket thing there, you know, looks like a napkin or whatever. Which one's most powerful? See, no, it's not a physical cloth covering on the head of a woman it's a male covering that's what the covering is there the power on her head um, and you say well what if you have a woman who her father's dead and she's single and she's in a place where she can't come under the authority of a pastor we'll say what what about that well first Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 for there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man, Christ Jesus. So in a sense, a Christian woman can have the headship of Jesus Christ. And at that point, even if she's unmarried, even if she doesn't have a father, and if she can't get to a good church somewhere, she can still have the man, Christ Jesus, as her power, the power on her head. Okay, and by the way, Jesus Christ is to be the mediator between God and men. Pastors are overseers of the flock. They are to teach to instruct, but they're never to come between anybody and the Lord. Okay, A pastor should be a road sign pointing people to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer for every problem.
problem that you face in life. Okay? So a woman needs to have Jesus Christ as her head, the power on her head there. And if she doesn't have that, if you have a lost woman who's a feminist, you got a problem. <laughs> okay? And that's and guess what's encouraged nowadays? That's the one that's encouraged. And I'm going to show you in just a couple minutes here that that's actually what they use in this movie. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, what what about these giants? There were giants in the earth in those days. Turn, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. And again, you know, you got to watch out for these people that try to spiritualize the scriptures. That's a Roman Catholic practice. They're always, they hit something they can't explain and they say, well, giant means that uh, they were over six foot tall or something. No, no, no. <laughs> don't, don't fall for that. When the Bible says giants, it means giants. And we're going to see about some of these giants here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10. It says here, The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites call them Emims. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau, Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them, and dwelt in their stead as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Now, these giants... Uh, we're going to read in Daniel here in, in just a couple of minutes here that uh, they don't exactly cleave together all that well. Is, or, or They don't ex exactly join together. In other words, they're not like this super race of extremely intelligent, extremely coordinated, powerful. <laughs> I think that they were, I think they were very strong. I think they were very big, these offspring. But the mixture didn't quite match up right. And you see these things being killed pretty easily. <laughs> I mean, they're like incredibly strong and big, and they're carrying huge swords and huge spears, but they were probably very slow and very stupid, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you could probably kill them pretty quickly and pretty easily. You know, they'd probably go to throw their 200 pound spear or something, and you just kind of jump out of the way, okay, and, you know, and they're dead. A um, little bit of spiritual nuggets there for you. Okay, jump, jump over to verse 20. In Deuteronomy chapter 2. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites call them Zamzumims. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them. And they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, even unto this day. And the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Aza, the Kaphtarims, which came forth out of Kaphtar, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. So not only did they have all these people coming after them, these big dopey giants, but uh, they also had the Lord against them. <laughs> Because they were offspring from a sinful relationship. And, you know, you gotta watch out for that too. Uh, now turn over to, or, uh, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel 21, verse 15. Alright, 2 Samuel 21, verse 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war with, again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbibanab, Ish which was of, of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. And Abishai, the son of Zeruai, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this, that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushathite <laughs> slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, 
where Elhanan, the son of Jerry Oregon, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Um, if you use an NIV, your Bible doesn't say that. It says that Elhanan, the son of Jerry Oregon, a Bethlehemite, slew Goliath. They took the brother of out. So the NIV creates a contradiction there. David slew Goliath. Okay, not Elhanan. Verse 20, And there was yet a battle in Gath where it was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was a was born to the giant. Now, how can you spiritualize that? How can you say that a giant wasn't really a giant? It was just another word for a, you know, this guy had six fingers and six toes. Okay, there was definitely some kind of weird thing going on there. Verse 21, And when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So again, you have them being killed. Now turn to Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to see about what's going to happen here in the future. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. Here you have the vision that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw of this great statue, and it had the ten toes that were part iron, part miry, miry clay. And it says here in verse 43, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with my, or even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now I believe probably that this is a reference to these fallen angels trying to do this thing over again. And I can tell you right now, you don't have to look very far with Hollywood and whatever else to realize that there are people out there that are perverted enough that they'd be all for it. And we're going to actually see that Hollywood is already preparing people for it. I'm going to show you that in just a couple of minutes here. Uh, but Matthew 24, verse 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And by the way, it says back there in Genesis 6 that there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. So it didn't end with the flood. But it was going on really bad before the flood in the days of Noah. And the Bible says it's going to happen again before the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So watch out for that. Now I'm going to play a clip here really quickly. This movie came out a couple years back. Let me see if I can get it here. It was called City of Angels. And it starred uh, Nicolas Cage and uh, Meg Ryan. Okay? And it is about an angel that gives up his habitation in heaven to fornicate with this woman. And they, it is, it is weird because they, they know exactly about these verses. They know what angels have to do. They know what happens. They know all about it. But what they do is they twist it. So it's no longer sin, it's no longer abomination. Now it's, oh, what a beautiful love story. And it makes women everywhere, oh, if only an angel would, would love me enough to give up heaven. That's what they do. That's what Hollywood does. Hollywood is Satan's uh, ministry of propaganda. Um, okay, let me play this here. What if angels walked the earth here? among us silent and unseen that doctor in the operating room she looked right at me and one of them no one can see you unless you want them to fell in love with one of us and if i want her to what do you want to do to help her Who are you visiting? You. If you yeah. met the one you were meant for. <laughs> I got this feeling that 
there's something bigger out there. There's something bigger than me and bigger than you. Close your eyes. But you could not sense their touch. I wait all day just hoping for one more minute with you. And I don't even know you. You could not feel their kiss. Did you feel that? No. And you could not trust your eyes. I want to see you. Would you still believe? Let me see you. In love. I don't understand a God who would let us meet if there's no way we could ever be together. Do you hear that? I don't understand a God that would allow us to meet if there was no way that we could be together. You see? See a little subtle attack against God? Actually, it's not really subtle. It's pretty much out in the open. Let's continue. He can give up his existence as he knows it and become one of us. You choose to fall to earth. And when you wake up, you're human. Isn't that something? Let me just pause it there again. Isn't that something? It's exactly what the Bible teaches. They gave up their first estate. They gave up their habitation. Hmm. But it's a beautiful thing now, and everybody has to talk like this. Oh, you know... You know, because then, oh, it's a love story. It's passion. It's it's love. Yeah. No, it's perversion is what they're doing. Let me finish it here. It's almost done. Endure it a little bit longer. Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. Meg Ryan. City of Angels. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, City of Fallen Angels. Yep, that's right. See, what do they choose? I mean, I didn't see the movie, and I have no intention of watching it. But the fact is, from what I've seen there in the in the the trailer for the movie, and that thing came out years and years and years ago. By the way, it's probably in the 1990s sometime. From what I've seen there, she's a single woman. See. She has no power on her head, no husband, and she's not saved. See? It's just like they know what the Bible says. Don't tell me that that's all just a coincidence, that they were able to just come up with that stuff out of thin air. No. They know exactly what happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future, and they're getting pre people prepared for it. And like I said, all these single women that are out there that have gone after their careers and everything else, the feminists... All of them are going to watch that and say, that's beautiful. It's disgusting, is what it is. Okay, it's wickedness, it's sin. And the fact is, the offspring, as I read earlier, the offspring of those perverted relationships, the Lord destroyed them. God didn't look down and go, oh, that's so beautiful that one of my angels went and fornicated with a woman down there, and now they have this lovely, giant, dopey giant, you know, the big green giant or something, you know. And, oh, he's he's a, just, oh, I, I'm so proud of, no, he, kill that. Destroy him, yeah, David, go on in there and kill all those guys. You know, the Lord's not for that. But Satan always perverts what God wants, what God does. Okay, so, lie number one that I think has been thoroughly debunked now is this thing that angels are sexless. That is a lie. Total lie. Okay, and, I, and I, okay, you say, well, I, my professor taught me that they are. Okay, show me one verse of scripture that proves that angels are sexless. One. And I've looked it up, by the way. I went through the concordance. I looked up every reference to angel, and there's not one reference in there that says that they're women or sexless. They're all men, and they all look like regular men, by the way, too. Okay, Genesis chapter 19 Turn back to Genesis 19. We're going to look at the appearance of an angel. What does an angel look like? Again, you see these uh, depictions of angels, and they're all winged. But we're going to look about that. See what the Bible has to say. Genesis 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. 
And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. <laughs> okay, uh, before I continue here, these two angels came because in the chapters preceding this, the Lord heard the cry of Sodom that it was wicked. There was a lot of perversion going on down there. It's called sodomy. All right, these sodomites were not born that way. They were perverts, just as they're perverts today. And God heard this wickedness down there. And, you know, Abraham said, if I can find 50 righteous per adventure, 45, how about 40, 30, 20, how about 10? And he couldn't. All that was down there was, was uh, Lot. Okay, one. And so the Lord sent these two angels to inspect it and see if it was true. Okay, the Lord's not going to wipe something out until he knows for sure, okay, yeah, they deserve it. True and righteous are his judgments. So these angels came there to see what was going on. And they're saying, oh, we'll stay out in the street all night. And Lot's going, <laughs> oh, no, 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 don't do that. Verse 3, and he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did break, or and did bake unleavened, unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the winged, sexless angels which came into thee this night? No. It says, Where are the men? Why didn't they say anything about wings? I mean, couldn't you tell if these big winged things, they were men. And why do you think the Sodomites were after them? Because they saw two men. They didn't see angels, they saw men. And it says, bring them out unto us that we may know them. Uh, verse 12. Jump down to verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, hast thou here any besides? Uh, Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters... And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Okay, so you have these angels came in to inspect it, but then the angels also came to destroy it. If they found out that things were evil and wicked. Okay, so the, and of course they did destroy it, by the way. Now turn over to Judges, Judges chapter 6. Joshua, Judges. Judges chapter 6, verse 20. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Why was it that Gideon didn't know that he was an angel until he performed that miraculous thing there. I mean, why? here's a guy talking to him for a while. Why did it take something miraculous like him making fire come out of a rock and consuming the food? You know, couldn't Gideon have just looked at his wings? <laughs> no, he was a regular man standing there. And he had to prove that he was an angel. Okay? Turn to Judges chapter 13. This is kind of an interesting story here. Uh, this is actually um, Samson's parents and their encounter with an angel. Okay, Judges chapter 13, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manorah, or Manoah, I'm sorry, not Manorah, Manoah. 
and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Of course, that's good advice for today, too, for women that are with child. Verse 5, For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me, neither told he me his name. Okay, now first of all, it was a man of God, not a woman. Okay, there are no female angels. Um, okay, keep reading here. Verse 7. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no, now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what shall we do or what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field, but, ben but Manoah her husband was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. Again, if this angel had wings, if he was like the popular depictions that you see, why did he say, Are you the man? Are you the one? Why was there confusion there? Okay, verse 12. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we, ha until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Why not? How could you speak to an angel and not know that he was an angel of the Lord? And by the way, you'll see this thing time and time again. And I'm going to get into this in a little bit more detail later. The angels never take glory away from God. And all this modern movement about angels, 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 you have wicked, lost, unsaved people that are all excited about angels and they don't want a thing to do with Jesus Christ. That's not of the Lord. An angel will always point people to Jesus Christ. They never say, oh, look at me, worship me, wear me on your t-shirt, put me on your car. Angels are among us and all this garbage. Okay, but anyhow, it goes down through there, and we're not going to read the whole thing. But the point is, he was speaking to him, and he didn't even know he was an angel. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Okay, Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Again, angels do not have wings. Okay? They can come to you, they'll look just like a regular man. That's the way it is. Oh, but yeah, but the, the pictures, the, the drawings. I have here a Catholic Bible, by the way. I almost forgot to show this. And here you have these Roman Catholic paintings inside of angels. You know, here you have Lot. Uh, of course, he's like a white, you know, European or something there. But you have Lot with his white wife and blonde-haired daughters. You always got to love that. 
and they're leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, and they got these angels taking them out. And you got this angel here, and it's got like these big, thick, manly legs, but the face is a woman, and it's got like this this green and pink, this green and pink like dress-looking thing on, you know, with the wings coming out the back. You know, that's not an angel. Well, maybe a fallen angel or some some kind of demonic thing. I don't know. But uh, here you have, an, again, you have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and this, this effeminate-looking thing with the feathery wings. You know, no. It doesn't work. Don't fall for that stuff. The regular men, you wouldn't be able to tell them. You could talk to them. You can entertain them. I mean, wouldn't that be something? You get some stranger and you entertain them. You have them in your house there and you give them a meal and you talk with them and laugh and maybe play a game or something with them. You know, and they walk away, and you find out in eternity that was an angel. Pretty amazing. But now, what about this thing of these females with feathery wings? Where did that come from? Well, I'll turn to the book of Zechariah. Back in your Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, Zechariah chapter 5. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, again you have a man, and he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness and he cast it into the midst of the ephah and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof then lifted i up mine eyes and looked and behold there came out two women and the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven then said i to the angel that talked with me whither do these bear the ephah and he said unto me to build it in house in the land of shinar and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. What are these creatures? I have no idea. <laughs> to be very honest with you, I don't know. But one thing is clear, they're not angels. The angel's talking here with him, and he's a man. Okay, there are never once does the Bible say an angel and she, or this, she's a woman or something. So there are these creatures there. But they're carrying something that the angel says is wickedness. Honestly, I don't know what those things are. But they're very clearly not angels. That is clear. Because it's an angel talking with him, and he doesn't even come close to resembling these women with the, with the wings. But are, are there beings in heaven that have wings? Yes. Turn to Ezekiel. Turn back a couple chapters to Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel 10, 8. Okay. Ezekiel 10, 8. And there appeared in the cherubims uh, the form of a man's hand under their wings. So you have another group here, the cherubim. Look at verse 14. And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. Okay, now verse 21. Every one had four faces apiece, and every one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man which was under their wings. Okay, so here you have these cherubim. They have four wings. Now there's another group. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. You have cherubims, and here in Isaiah you have seraphim. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. 
Now turn back to Revelation chapter 4. So you have cherubim have four wings. Seraphim have six wings. Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. How many wings did they have? Six. Now, some people say, well, these are cherubim that are around the throne. No, cherubim have four wings. I believe they're seraphim. They have six wings. Now, are there other types of beings in heaven? Yes, there are archangels. Two are mentioned in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. Uh, we're not going to look these up. I'll give you the references here very quickly. Michael the archangel shows up in Daniel 10, 13 and verse 21. Daniel 12, 1, Jude 9, Revelation 12, 7. Almost every single reference to Michael the archangel is he's fighting, contending with Satan. Revelation 12, 7, Michael and his angels fight the dragon and his angels and kick him out of heaven. So Michael is more of a fighting angel. Gabriel is the other archangel that's mentioned, and he shows up Daniel eight sixteen through 19, uh, chapter 9, verses 21 through 22, and Luke 1, 19 and 26. Of course, the passage there in Luke, he's speaking to Mary. So he's more of a messenger. Every time you can look those verses up, every time he shows up, he's bringing messages to Daniel, and he's bringing messages to Mary. So God has different angels for different purposes. Okay, now turn to Colossians chapter 2. Don't have much more to go here. Colossians chapter 2. I kind of spoke of this a little bit earlier, but we're going to cover it here. Colossians 2.18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward and involuntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Right there tells you about the problem that I mentioned earlier. People get into this worshiping of angels things and they haven't seen them. Okay, don't believe in this stuff. I was, you know, here and I saw wings go past my vehicle or something. No, you know, no, don't fall for that. An angel would never do anything to draw glory away from Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you saw wings going past your uh, vehicle, it was probably either an eagle or you know, turkey buzzard. Or, you know, we saw that angels don't have wings. Okay, so, but the point is, all these people that are into this worshiping of angels thing, all the TV shows and all the movies that are coming out, giving all the glory to angels, and these angels are doing great things and touched by an angel and all this. It's all taking glory away from Jesus Christ. And he's the head. And when they worship angels, they don't hold the head. Okay, he's the head of the body of Christ. So you watch out for that thing. Don't fall for that. I don't think that you should have statues of angels all over your house. I think something's a little wacky there. Now finally, let's close by answering a question. Will we be angels in heaven? Turn to 1 John chapter 3. It's another popular thing that you see. You know, the family circus uh, comic strip. You know, the grandfather, he's always up in heaven on a cloud with a harp and he's got his wings there, you know. And of course, he's still an old man, which is kind of weird. But um, Matthew 22, verse 30, which we read earlier, I'll read it here again. It says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But 1 John 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, 
and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man ha that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Look at verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Who were the sons of God in the Old Testament? Angels. Are they still in their habitation? No. Some of them are. They didn't all fall. But the point is, a lot of them did fall. So guess what? There's a group of angels that's missing now. Now, I believe at the, at the rapture, when we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, that we will be as the angels of God in heaven. Okay? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. When you get saved, you don't go, boom, and you're transformed into an incorruptible being. No, you still have a corruptible body. And, of course, that's a whole other study. Your flesh is not redeemed. Your soul and your spirit are. That's why your flesh is still capable of all the sins of the lost world. You got to watch your flesh. Your flesh is the enemy. Okay. Now the Holy Spirit's there, and He can convict of sin and everything else. We do have it better than the, than the lost. I'm not saying that you know, whatever. But the the fact is, it doesn't appear what you shall be when you get saved. That comes later at the resurrection. Okay. Now turn to Philippians three, verse twenty. Philippians 3.20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We truly will be like Christ someday. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six talks about um, our some of our millennial inheritance and our responsibilities. First Corinthians chapter six verse two: Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Could it be that we're going to be the ones that are judging these angels that have fallen, that have left their first habitation? I believe that's what it means. Why? Well, because at the resurrection, we're going to be given the mind of Christ. We're going to see things as he sees things. Uh, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Here you have John... In heaven, before the time of Jacob's trouble begins, before the great tribulation. It says here, verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Okay, it's talking about the 24 elders there. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now look at verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Uh, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Everybody in heaven is going to be, is going to be praising Jesus Christ. Um, Angels aren't standing up there trying to get glory for themselves. But who are the angels there? The many angels. I think that they're probably at least partly Christian. Uh, the Christians that are changed. Now turn to Revelation 19. we got two more places to turn to and then we're done. Revelation 19, verse 9. Here you have chapter 19 is about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says here, verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now look at verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. 
And he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of, of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, if that's an eternal angel that was around back in the Old Testament, one of the original sons of God, how could he have the testimony of Jesus? And how could he say he's of thy brethren? But who is this that's talking with him? I looked through the whole chapter there, and it really never identifies, you know, who was talking to him. But it does identify him in Revelation 22, verse 8. Okay, Revelation 22, verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which shewed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So it was an angel that was showing him the things here in the book of Revelation. And when he fell down to worship before him, two things. He said, See thou do it not, worship God. And he said, and number two, he said, I'm thy fellow servant, I'm of I'm your brother, and I have the testimony of Jesus. So, whether or not you want to believe that, whatever. Okay, I do believe that Christians are going to be angels. We're not going to have wings, okay, in heaven. That's not there. But the, the main thing I want to get across through this study is don't fall for this thing about worshiping of angels. Don't overemphasize an angel. Um, but they are male. They're not female. And they are not sexless. Okay, so that's what this sermon was about, and I guess that's it for now. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, Please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.